prosthetic memory. This was originally done for a course on, uh, well, memory and the home and domesticity in graduate school. I have chosen to just update it a little, add some more spice um, so that it can go on YouTube. Please let me know if you need a copy of Landsberg's book. If you message me through my website, I'll hook you up because it's not that cheap. All right, get ready. What is prosthetic memory? Alison Landsberg's view of prosthetic memory places it as a new form of public cultural memory that is able to emerge at the point where a person or people engage with a historical narrative in places like museums, memorials, or theaters. It's a form of second-hand memory that appears only capable of existing in specific spaces and is made possible by mass culture and, I'd argue, pop culture as well. Prosthetic memory was made possible by modernity, but that it has also made this new form of memory a necessity. Prosthetic memory, part two. Landsberg argues that the differences between prosthetic memories and their precursors is that the latter works by creating, quote, a common national identity that was supposed to supersede differences caused by class, race, etc. In contrast, um, prosthetic memory is supposed to create connection to the past without erasing contemporary differences or constructing a, quote, common original identity. Prosthetic memory is connected inextricably with the idea of diaspora. Prosthetic memory, in essence, revolves around the creation and sharing of memories that, despite their lack of connection to lived experiences, remains integral to our view of subjectivity. Landsberg gives four reasons for why she calls these memories prosthetic. First, they're not natural and are formed from witnessing, not necessarily experiencing. Second, the memories are worn, quote, on the body, like a prosthetic limb. Third, Landsberg's use of prosthetic serves to underscore their flexibility slash interchangeability. Four, it's a way to show how useful they are in shaping people, people's thoughts of the world around them. In this book, Landsberg writes that, quote, the memories forged in response to modernity's ruptures do not belong exclusively to a particular group. Through the technologies of mass culture, it becomes possible for these memories to be acquired by anyone, regardless of skin color, ethnic background, or biology. But, and this is the problem I found with similar commentaries, Having access to prosthetic memories, to this public memory, does not automatically make the memory and experiences yours, even if they're about your people. Before mass culture, people were constantly remembering pasts that they hadn't lived. It's not a new thing. People watching performances of Shakespeare's plays, particularly the ones focusing on long-dead monarchs like Cleopatra, Cleopatra, Mark Anthony, Caesar, perhaps would have provided a rudimentary form of prosthetic memory. Look at public and private museums around the world where people were able to observe new content and create new memories for themselves based on established uh, ideas of what these people put themselves through in the past. Additionally, religious rituals serve to create, quote, memories of the Bible and its teachings. You know, Landsberg references the modernization of biblical stories in Middle Ages art to the point where there was a uniform Jesus, a uniform Mary, uniform angels, and they frequently looked nothing like the people who lived in that part of the world or the descriptions we were given in the Bible and related religious texts. Three cases. So, in researching the formation of prosthetic memories, Landsberg's book looks at three specific cases where prosthetic memories almost had to be created as direct memory transmission was impossible. 
European immigrants in the 1910s and 1920s, African Americans after and kind of during slavery or enslavement, and Jewish and Roma people following the Shoah or Holocaust. These three cases or situations all involve people losing access to their history, culture, and identity. The latter two directly involve the interrupted transmission of memories due to A, enslavement, and B, attempted or successful genocide. So let's talk about the role that movie theaters and mass culture played in prosthetic memories. As I understand it, movie theaters essentially sparked the birth of prosthetic memory. The turn to mass culture, to movies, experiential museums, television shows, and so forth, has made what was once considered a group's private memory available to a much broader public. Cinema had an integral role in expanding the average consumer's access to places, narratives, experiences, and identities that they otherwise wouldn't have access to. It helped shape the way that we understood what other people were doing, but it also placed an entitlement on audiences that allowed them to access these experiences, but then demand more of them. Travel, films, documentaries, historical fiction, a la Gone with the Wind, all served as windows to experiences that average folks couldn't have visualized before, especially in the context of the literacy uh, numbers in the United States, which remain very low regardless of how we frame ourselves in the popular context. Most Americans cannot read beyond a high school level. Most Americans stop reading in high school. And so that means that their engagement historically with literature, with media, is pretty freaking low, which is not a judgment call. It just means that their understanding of what we create and why we create it is not at the level of, or not always at the level of historical, like literary bigwigs. According to a study done by Herbert Bloomer, quote, the cinema dethrones lived experience as the only type of experience enough to shape or construct identity. As a result, identity and memory couldn't be more tightly intertwined. People were able to place themselves into the shoes of the characters and personalities that they watched in films, bouncing between genres. One example is the role the birth of a nation played in popular USCN culture. The birth of a nation was based on Thomas Dixon Jr.'s 1905 play and novel, The Klansman. Pro-Confederacy, extremely anti-black, racist as hell, and involving blackface alongside anti-black stereotypes of sexual sexuality and violence, this film and novel framed the Klan as heroes protecting vulnerable white people from hordes of sexually aggressive, violent black men who were out to get their young. This was actually screened in the White House by President Woodrow Wilson, and considering in 2008, when I took a film class, this is one of the films we watched because of how integral it was to the development of film, um, the impact it has had on generation of audiences and creators is very difficult to express because it is so massive. This film is responsible for so much rot, both in how Hollywood understands who black people are, but how regular people do because of the prosthetic memories it grafted onto the average viewer, whether they were white or black. From my October 21 fan service column on horror movies and why fan loves love being scared. The Birth of a Nation was a horror film, especially if you were a black person. Horror historian and author Tana Nareev Du says at one early point in Horror Noir, A History of Black Horror. The Birth of a Nation counts as early horror to Du and many other horror experts in Horror Noir because of what it revolved around and what it inspired next. The film centers a black character played by a white man in blackface actually threatening a young white girl before he's punished for it and is lynched by the clan in the film. 
It is responsible for reviving fears that black people were going to hurt innocent white women and girls. It is directly responsible for the rebirth of the Klan and was used as a recruitment tool that led to an increase in lynchings and the new weaponization of cross burnings, a tactic introduced in the film as a method of striking fear into the hearts of black people across the country. Birth of a Nation is revisionist racist history that reorients the relative recent history at the time of the United States and the post-Reconstruction world as, quote, in favor of white supremacy. I mean, it is, but it actively reorients it. This film taught the Klan new techniques like cross-burning and the aggressive lynching, and essentially serves the same purpose as pre-2020 Tumblr users, claiming they were, quote, triggered by angry black people, to then excuse harassing and abusing the hell out of them, only with direct and deadly impact. Pop culture can kill, and it can also be used as a tool of subjugation and destabilization, even without initial government impact. Like, your propaganda does not have to be created on the government's dime for it to be propaganda. If it serves that purpose, it serves that purpose. If you think fiction can't impact reality, please read a goddamn book. So let's talk about prosthetic memory and black narratives. So we'll start with A Subtlety or A Marvelous Sugar Baby. Created by Kara Walker, this is a statue made out of refined sugar, white sugar. It was subject to racist sexualization by people who came to the art exhibit. Note that the figure is topless to represent how the mammy figure was simultaneously desexualized, look at her face, she is presented as ugly, and hypersexualized as a being with large breasts who nurtures uh, not just the children of the um, enslaver, but the enslaver themselves who would reach to her. From Denise Oliver Velez's Sugar, Slavery, and Subtlety. The doorway visual was the huge sugar sphinx as far from the door and framed by girders, but the relation to that sculpture was put off by the smaller sugar babies close to the entrance. Children made of sugar and molasses burdened with large baskets and heavy balls, bales of sugar cane. Some of these children with obvious signs of malnutrition far too thin with a distended abdomen of starvation, is what engage visitors to, quote, a subtlety. Many of these sculptures are melting in the heat of the refinery, screaming disposable child labor. If that visual is too subtle, some are prone in bleeding molasses, while others have been wrapped in plastic and disposed of in cans. Please note that if you look up any references to a subtlety, many of the photographs and kind of interactions from audience members involve taking selfies of the exhibit or with the exhibit and mocking it, cupping the sphinx's breasts or posing besides the melting children. Um, it's clear that the idea of prosthetic memory did not impart empathy on the audience at any point. Prosthetic memory, blackness, and film. Alex Haley. So Roots is honestly one of the best examples of prosthetic memory and the relations between it and empathy. It gave African Americans the ability to visualize the experiences that their ancestors most likely had before, during, and after their enslavement. Haley went searching for his roots because so much of his own history had been denied to him due to slavery, and as a result, he was, access, he was able to provide Black people access to this prosthetic memory that perhaps filled in gaps in their experiences. We didn't all have the same ancestral experiences. My ancestors came from somewhere other than Haley's, you know, and those experiences are different from someone living in a favela in Brazil, right? Like their ancestors had different experiences. But Haley was able to fill in blanks 
And in his search for the truth about what happened to his direct ancestors, provided truths about what happened to many of our ancestors across the African diaspora. While the original version of the video I embedded in this PowerPoint originally is gone, uh, thanks to you, as you can see, copyright claim, um, I found a quote that captures my thoughts from the scene from Alex Haley. In all of us, there is a hunger, marrow deep, to know our heritage, to know who we are and where we have come from. Without this enriching knowledge, there is a hollow yearning. No matter what our attainments in life, there is still a vacuum, an emptiness, and the most disquieting loneliness. And that is what Roots offers people, offers members of the African diaspora, wherever we may have come to live. He, through Roots, offers us something to fill the emptiness, the loneliness, to shut off the vacuum. Let's talk about historical fiction and prosthetic memory. So Hidden Figures is a really good example of um, historic fiction that kind of reinvents or reintroduces uh, viewers to a history that was denied to them. In this case, this film, which I did take my niece links to see back when it was in theaters, this film was um, very useful for kind of attaching our desire for like black women in STEM and raising up an audience of people who saw themselves in the in this world and wanted to know more about it. It provided building blocks necessary for black women to see themselves in the relatively recent history of um, space exploration, early computers, etc., as well as the backdrop of the civil rights era, because these are this is when these women were actively, um, well, living their best lives. So let's talk about Kindred. Kindred is probably Octavia Butler's most famous work outside of diehard sci-fi fans. It deals with slavery and enslavement from the point of view of a, quote, modern character that is sent backwards in time to the antebellum South. It is an unflinching portrayal of slavery and enslavement and slave owners. The graphic novel is something that I believe I reviewed for, um, uh, what was that? I reviewed it for one of those comic book sites a few years ago before it, like, vanished into the dust. And it is a really good example of how we come to this sort of content and find ourselves within it. Get Out technically isn't a historical film, but I did see it around the time when this movie came out. It was I was living in basically the neighborhood that the film was set. And so it kind of provided now a historical but authentic look at a specific kind of black experience because a lot of black people to date uh out you know date interracially i have that experience of coming to the coming to the family of your partner and realizing wow these bitches are racist as shit um and it's not a great experience but also this elevates the experience takes it from I'm unsettled and I don't know why to I'm unsettled and this is why. And I think it is very useful for unpacking a specific kind of horror and a very specific kind of experience that not many people understand that we still have. We joke about seeing the white fathers with their guns aimed at young black teenagers. And I say we, but I do not mean we, because it is not funny to this we, but joking about shooting the young black boy dating their white daughter. But the reality is that this is a form of horror. It is a form of subjugation. It is a form of oppression. And it inspires and instills fear within people because, you know, you you go home with your white girlfriend and her dad threatens you but your dad is, her dad has also voted for obama two times and would vote for him a third time if he could so how do you express that fear even outside of the context 
of the horror narrative of enslavement, subjugation, brainwashing that is present in Get Out, and the fact that these people have been getting away with oppressing Black people for generations. How do you deal with that? And I think Get Out is pretty much one of the most brilliant films I've ever seen, and it provides a form of prosthetic memory, and this is where the prosthetic memory can in fact be layered on top of non-Black people's experiences because it was able to open doors for non-Black audiences, which includes non-Black people of color, to then go, oh, that's what that was. Oh, I understand now. Oh, I'm never going to that neighborhood again. And I think it's just, you know, brilliant. So let's talk conclusions slash questions for for further discussion. This was initially created as a result of a grad degree program. Um, So I kind of updated the conclusions and questions to talk about where we're at now. So first of all, fiction has always impacted how we understood ourselves and others. It does not matter how people claim otherwise, fiction impacts how we see ourselves in the world and how we see other people, especially when more or differently marginalized. You know, queer people have always been seen as monsters in horror. Uh, Black people are aggressive. Women via misogyny, a lens of misogyny. So why? And then for marginalized communities, especially in the context of diaspora, media serves as a way for us to connect connect across time and physical space with our ancestors and our shared experiences. I am able to connect with my late grandmother through content about our island in the 1800s, you know, or the early 1900s. Um, Survivors, descendants of survivors of the Shoah, of the Holocaust, are able to connect with their family members, through journals, through media made by people within those communities. You know, we are able to learn who we are from what the people around us have created. And it's important to acknowledge that some of what we have created or that other people have created about us, you know, don't tell the full story. Which leads us to this next question. If prosthetic memories born of, quote, modernity's ruptures do not belong exclusively to a particular group, how do we recognize and reconcile our beloveds, you know, our family, our friends, our lovers, parts, in oppression and erasure of our people through media? Who gets to define what we went through as people with this prosthetic memory and this epigenetic memory? If we all have access to memories and media that gives us these memories that don't belong to us, and what about that white man who claims he was traumatized by Beloved in high school and that's why, you know, critical race theory should ban it? Like, what about that? Was he traumatized because he understood the horror of enslavement and the fear that would drive you to murder your child? Or was he traumatized because he saw himself in the people who were chasing the main characters and that urged the death of Beloved? Questions upon questions. 